Okay, good evening. Welcome to Grand Blank Township Board of Trustees meeting for Tuesday, August 24th. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Okay, Clerk Robertson, would you care to call the roll? Yes, Mr. Supervisor. Trustee Hugo. Here. Trustee Fike. Here. Trustee Raritan. Here. Trustee White. Here. Treasurer Kilmer. Here. Myself. Here. Supervisor Bennett. Yes, here. Thank you. Seven nothing the quorum. Okay, and now I'll ask for an approval of the regular agenda. Motion by Dr. Raritan, supported by Mr. Fike. Okay, motion by Raritan, supported by Fike. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Moving on to uh, public comments. We'll invite anybody in the public that wishes to, uh, to speak to give their name and address and uh, come on up. Give their name and address and I know the give us your three minutes. Ed Hurt, 7212 Porter Road. I just wanted to start off with a little story here. Probably about 15 years ago, I was overcessed on my property about 20%. And we got that all straightened out. We didn't have to go to the tribunal. The assessing office took care of it. And when the money came to me, it says we only go back 18 months. So that's as far as you can go back to get your taxes. That makes me think about what happened with the McFarland Library at your last meeting. It was four years. They went back. They were supposed to bill you and be happy with what they billed you. But they went back and said they made a mistake, and they want four years back. I don't know if that's appropriate. I just thought that was unfair to go back that far. I mean, how far do we go back? Like in the Parks and Recs, do we go back to 1974 and straighten the books out? I think there has to be a statute of limitation there. So, you know, I just wanted to bring that up because the library is ran by the GDL. The only thing we do there, in fact, the money for the GDL line share comes from the township. So it's basically the building that we share with the city. We're partners on a building. It's all it is, is a physical structure, and we maintain it. And I wonder why we split 60-40. Do we own the building 60-40? I guess that'd be OK if we're paying 60% and we own 60%. So, you know, I guess, does this board really under, no, do we own it 60-40? And if we own it 60-40, we should be saying what's going on there because we own the lion's share. But if we own it 50-50, why aren't we paying 50-50? So I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to make public comment? Seeing no further public comment, uh, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the board. And at this time, I will ask for an approval of the consent agenda. Motion by Trustee Hugo. Support by Trustee Fike. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? With that, we will move to our strategic plan update. And uh, in your packet, I believe, uh, that was in the packet, right, Mr. Lehman? Yeah. I wasn't sure if you sent it out separately or, but we have the uh, Saginaw Street Corridor study. Hopefully everybody had a chance to, to browse through it a little bit. Um, there was considerable amount of work uh, put in on this in 2008. And it appears, uh, you know, through discussion that maybe uh, right after the document was put together and the study was done, uh, we hit uh, some recessionary times. So plan wasn't really uh, carried out at, at that point. Um, but there was everything from actually professional study to focus group bringing in residents and businesses for their suggestions. Um, and it's very detailed. So Mr. Lehman, anything you'd like to report on? That with us? As part of the strategic plan, the board selected Saginaw Street Corridor improvements as one of the goals 
uh, and with the key objective being um, improved infrastructure and appearance of the north end of the township, one of the first things that we put in under our uh, strategies and tactics was to review the 2008 Saginaw Street Corridor Plan. Um, you know, I think it's important, especially for uh, the new board to come together now that we've made this a uh, strategic plan item, to at least review this and see if it is still even relevant. This was prepared by the then uh, Planning Commission, um, but, you know, even though it's a corridor study, it really, it's your vision as a board, not so much the Planning Commission's, it's, you know, the seven individuals here that are going to uh, move the strategic plan forward. So I think that this was a good spot to start. You Maybe you liked some of this corridor study, maybe some of it's still relevant, maybe some of it isn't any longer, it doesn't fit the vision of where this board would like to take us. So I think that's the kind of discussion I'm looking for. Do we want to bounce this back to the Planning Commission for a review to see if it you know, is still relevant or updated, or does it fit <clears throat> anywhere near your idea of what you'd like to see happen in that Saginaw Street corridor? And I think if the board can provide us some feedback there, then that will give us a better idea of which direction you'd like us to go in as staff. I think one of the things I remember when we were putting together a strategic plan, I know we said, or actually Mr. Limita said, you know, what would you like it to look like, you know, in five years? And don't worry about money. <laughs> and Are you this sure is that's what I said? <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of those plans that looks beautiful. And if we had an unlimited budget, I'd say let's go and do all these things, right? Um, unfortunately, we, we do have a limited budget. I, I love, you know, the ideas in here. It's kind of overwhelming uh, the amount of, you know, things that are in here. I guess it's a great blueprint. It's kind of like, to me, it's more like what could we afford to start with here? Uh, one step that we're taking is actually we have a meeting in the next couple of weeks with all the property owners along Saginaw Street uh, between Hill and uh, Maple. And so we're going to get some direction from them and I think we'll wanna share, you know, probably some of them were participants in this plan, I would guess. Um, but I'd like to you know, talk with them about this and get some feedback from them <clears throat> because a number of the things would take their cooperation, right? I mean, um, some of the suggestions are you know, you look along Saginaw Street and the chain link fence that we have. If that were a uniform look along here where instead of having chain link, we had some type of decorative type fence, um, it would make a huge difference. Um, but again, it's going to take the property owner. If, if we're looking at a low interest uh, loan program for refacing the fronts of their buildings or for putting sidewalks in, it's going to take their cooperation to do that. Um, so there, there's lots of ideas in here. It's kind of a matter of where we, where do we start? Looking at the outline that uh, Mr. Limita put together as far as how the staff might uh, <clears throat> progress on this, um, the goal, you know, was community vitality, Saginaw Street corridor improvement. It starts out with review of the 2008. Saginaw Street Corridor Plan, which is the plan that we all received. Um, design standards, update the plan, present plan to township uh, board for approval, create implementation plan. I mean, the, this even had a resolution that I don't believe probably was passed. Um, Mr. Laddie may know because he probably was on the board back then. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I cannot recall. Okay. As I'm sitting here tonight. It's a couple meetings ago. A couple meetings ago. <laughs> but uh, there's a resolution in here as far as uh, Saginaw Street study uh, amendment to the master plan. So there's there's a lot to digest here. Uh, but, you know, a group of people put the time and the effort into putting the plan together. So I think it's worthy of us spending a little bit of time and going through it. Um, Everything from street lights to sidewalks <coughs> to bike paths, what have you. Any thoughts from anybody on this? It obviously was something that was important to us as a board. It was listed as one of our areas. I have. Yes, Mr. Gilmer. <clears throat> I look at this, and I agree with you. There's, there's a lot of good ideas in here, but it's kind of like, okay, where do we start? 
-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I, we, we need to identify something, latch on to it and do it, and then progress from there because obviously since 2008, none of this has happened. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right. Mr. Robertson. Yeah, I, um, well, first of all, I think the meeting on, uh, that's coming up very soon yes. uh, is a good place to start because uh, any uh, look at the corridor study, it jumps out at you that this would require considerable private investment. Uh, in order to in order to realize the vision here, and the property owners have a stake in it, and we obviously the conversation begins with them to find out what we we need to do uh, to make it more likely for them to invest privately in their own property and improve the overall look of the uh, uh, of the of the the mile stretch there, the the entire triangle, if you will. Um, uh, obviously, we have our role to play, and and the plans that we have for for uh, uh, the D DPS building uh, and uh, fire hall are arguably are a public contribution to the overall uh, area, but the still it's still heavily weighted toward private investment. So I think that the conversation that you've called for, that you've scheduled for, is a good place to start. Mr. <clears throat> this is a 13-year-old study, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Would it unduly uh, delay it to send it back to the planning commission, the current planning commission, and say, "All right, here it is. Uh, there's, it's a great plan, but it's expensive. Are there prior? Let, give us maybe five priorities from this that where we could go on um, sidewalks, streetlights, what have you, so that we have a, a better indication as to how to proceed. When is this meeting, by the way, with the, with the folks? We're doing it September eighth. Is that too quick to send it to the Planning Commission? Or? I don't think they would have it back yet. They're, yeah. they're going to be meeting September 2nd, uh, but in, they would get it in their hands, and that's about it. But yeah. um, I don't think it's a bad idea to have them review it. Um, I think I agree with Mr. Robertson that we'll get some ideas from you know the business owners as to what they feel would be a priority and what, what they could realistically maybe uh, fund or you know what they would see as important to them so sidewalks if I'm a business I pay for that right now it is yes um, we priced it out uh, several years ago I think before mr. Limita was uh, on board but I think back then <clears throat> you know, it was about eight hundred thousand dollars and that was prior to even looking at the cost of moving the utilities because there's a uh, quite a few utilities that would be um, in the way of a sidewalk street light same thing What's that? The, like decorative lights? Um, we didn't uh, price that out, but that's another idea too. That, you know, do some decorative lights. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, you also run into that if we're going to do it between Maple and um, Hill Road, right. is what about the businesses south of uh, there or along Hill Road that will say, hey, how come you're not spending some money over in my area? Well. Um, Dennis, maybe you can speak to there. There is the possibility of uh, we have the DDA in the in a, the south part of the township. There is the possibility of forming a corridor improvement. Uh, what is it, CIP or something or what corridor yeah, the, improvement? It, even in the 2008 study, and it was actually it was 14 years ago that they undertook this study, September of, of 2007, um, and finalized it a year later. You look at one of the recommendations that they had for their action strategies was to create a corridor improvement authority. It would function much like the DDA does. You'll create a tax increment financing uh, district, and then any uh, once you have the baseline set, then you'd capture anything um, that goes in and goes above that. One of the toughest parts about doing that is if you're in an area, we, you know, we created our DDA it has a lot of vacant land, so it was easy to capture a baseline. As soon as something goes on there, we've just picked up like Magna, you know, 20 some million dollars worth of new taxable value because it went on that vacant land. Creating a tax increment financing district here in the northern part of the, uh, that corridor is really built out. It would take somebody comes in and really uh, has some impact, takes down one of the old buildings and puts up something new before you start capturing positive taxable value. So just caution the board that creating that. I'm not against it. I think it could be a good idea so that you can start to fund some of those improvements. 
but it will take several years to have positive financial flow into that mm -hmm. TIF district. So it works the same way as our DDA does. It's just not going to have as the impact will be much slower. It's going to take you a while to actually develop uh, the financial wherewithal to be able to put sidewalks in or do something with the utilities. <clears throat> But if it, once it spurs and things start to move, then you know how it goes, where it's just a chain reaction and the whole area starts to pick up, then that taxable value would be positive and it, was, it, it would increase that flow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Over the years, we have had a few businesses that came in and made some drastic improvements uh, to a few of the buildings. One very recently uh, that put a considerable amount of investment into their building along Saginaw Street. Any thoughts on, on I think, you know, one of the things that you guys should consider is if, is the plan still relevant? Is this what this board envisions when we talk about, you know, you, you selected the Saginaw Street corridor improvement, you know, and, and appearance of the North End. Is this uh, overreaching of what your vision was when you came together for your strategic plan? Um, maybe it's worth uh, the folks on the board who are interested, uh, having three board members work with Planner Smith on a review of it to see if it's really uh, still relevant and this is kind of the plan that you guys have. Again, it's a long range plan, but it has to start somewhere. And if we would have started back in 2008, of course the bottom fell out of the economy right after they launched this thing and that's why it never moved forward. I love the look of it, you can, uh, you can really imagine what you know, Saginaw Street would look like if it if it looked like this, but it's it's a very aggressive plan, and it definitely will take years. But it's got to start somewhere. They're talking about you know uh, putting in some feeder roads behind feeder streets behind and underground utilities, and I mean very aggressive, very expensive, but you do it a piece at a time. Um, again, but it has to fit your vision. I mean, you, you have to set it. If you kick it to the planning commission right now, they're going to say. Yeah, it looks good, and bounce it back to you. It would be my fear, right? Yeah. Because they, it's your vision that we, we've got to encompass. If you look at this and say, no, this was way too aggressive, like this is overreaching, we're never going to move this forward, what we mean by that is, you know, we can uh, throw out the Saginaw Street Corridor plan or let's focus on these, you know, five things that we liked about it because what you're trying to accomplish is not what was in this plan from 2008. You know, there, there may be some low-hanging fruit that isn't in the plan. You know, the, I, I look at, you know, as you come across Maple Road on Saginaw Street, coming into Grand Blank Township, there's a building on both sides that welcome you, and both of them look horrible. Um, if, if, if I could wave the magic wand on Saginaw Street north of Hill Road, what would I do, I guess is what I'm thinking, to make the biggest improvement in the quickest way? And it would be to do something with those two buildings that are probably the biggest eyesore in the whole uh, stretch. And it's the first thing that you see when you come into uh, the township. How you do that, I don't know. But I'm just saying, you know, this plan is very exhaustive in terms of covers everything from nuts to bolts, everything from feeder streets to what have you. But um, I think part of what we have to do is get <clears> – <throat> investment coming into the area to start with because um, otherwise um, I think you know we're going to be funding all this and uh, the idea is how do we spur private development to come into the area we have some vacant land along there there's some vacant buildings that if we could get uh, businesses to to see it as a desirable area would be what we need to do I think but um, so yeah, I think a reordering of you know what's in this plan. There, there's a few things like these buildings that are vacant that probably weren't around or weren't vacant when this plan was put together. So I would I would be in favor of having a three member committee made up of our board. I I know Paul has expressed a lot of interest in this, Mr. White. That is, um, I would be willing to serve on it. Um, <coughs> I don't know anybody else willing. To serve on on that committee miss hugo okay and that'd be great because miss hugo serves on the planning commission so um 
We'll plan to meet and go through. Yes, Mr. White. I just have a couple. And, sure. and I, I would not be in favor of kicking this back to the Planning Commission because I always feel like that would be spinning wheels for three or four months, yeah. and then it would end up back in front of us, and we go, okay, now what do we do? Um, what can we do with the Road Commission? Because I think part of this is just the design of Saginaw Street is a big barrier to really improving it. I mean, it's a five-lane road. It's tough to create a walkable area in a five-lane road. I mean, I always say the Dorton Saginaw intersection scares me more than about any other intersection in the area because you've just the angle they drive at the high speed. I mean, what could we do to possibly, you know, try to get a like a roundabout put in there to slow everybody down, for one? And when you slow people down, then it's going to spur closer investment. You know, to, you're going to create a more walkable area if people actually slow down to nothing, versus, you know, because people aren't traveling 55 at that door. When I turn on the on the Saginaw, they're going 65, yeah. and uh, it's, it's scary. You got to hit the gas to, to get through there, and people don't want to walk in the area where you've got to fly through there. So I don't know what we can do as a board. That seems like something more the road commission, but the planning, Metropolitan Planning Commission, I'm not exactly sure what mm -hmm. to do. Yeah, the, uh, the speed along there is, you know, uh, pretty significant. I know in the plan it talks about maybe even the idea of putting a boulevard down the center of, of Saginaw Street. Clerk Robertson? Yeah, I like I said, I, I reviewed the quarter study over the last few days, and and uh, I'm not, a, I'm no traffic engineer, and no, nobody, nobody is on this board, and and uh, but there's a real science to how roads are built, and uh, a, a particular mile stretch can't be taken in isolation because it's connected to everything else, and I'm not sure even if they wanted to do a boulevard, whether or not. The traffic engineers would permit it. Uh, uh, that's a whole can of worms just to itself. As far as traffic speeds, these things are dictated by state sta state statute. They're dictated by the number of ingresses egresses that are exist on a particular particular stretch. So there's a lot of different variables in the equation with regard to that. And I so it's I understand your sentiment, and I appreciate um, Trustee White's. Uh, you know, keeping this issue in front of the board because you're right, we do need to address the issue of, of this stretch of road as a gateway and as the northern gateway to Grand Lake Township. Um, but uh, boy, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not s sure how easy it's going to be to alter traffic patterns or speeds or what have you in the area. I'm no. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. I'm no traffic engineer, but uh, I do know, and from reading the study, um, as well as having served a little bit on the planning commission, that. The entrances and exits to the businesses between uh, Hill Road and Maple on Saginaw Street would never be allowed today the way they're set up. I mean, um, you know, in the study it says, you know, the distance between some of these entrances and exits are like, you know, just a matter of a few feet. Um, and, you know, if a new business were to come in, we probably would require some changes in that regard. But, yeah, I mean, you don't know these things though until you explore them. So I'm all about seeing what the options are. We've talked, you know, it's at Saginaw Street though. I mean, is is five lane from, you know, from the city of Grand Blanc all the way up to, uh, you know, through Burton, in fact, and it's a state road. So they're going to have, you know, the authority on that. But yes, Mr. Kilmer. I believe. Uh, I, I'm not positive on this because I don't remember seeing the signs out, but I believe they just raised the speed limit on Dort Highway in that section that it is now 55 miles an hour. Is that correct? I see our police chief shaking his head yes in agreement. Yeah, it, so it went from 45 to 55, which doesn't really help what Mr. White is talking about at all. Yeah. Although maybe it gets people on Dort, people that want to go faster take Dort instead of Saginaw Street. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure why that was the case. But you know, one one thing we're looking at here that was mentioned is you know with our campus projects, we have a committee that's meeting to talk about uh, you know how we're going to develop our campus here with the fire department and potentially DPW building. And part of the idea that that has been discussed and I brought up 
was you know turning this into a park like setting you go down to Oakland County for example to where their courthouse is where their county services and it's like a park that you can walk from one building to the other and with our campus here you can actually have a path going around the pond back here and it will add some uh, some park area to the this area since there there isn't any really um, which would help improve the area So I guess we'll refer this to our committee that yeah, we'll go through it a little bit more. We've got a meeting on the 8th that we'll get some input from business owners as to what they see. Uh, Mr. Fike and then Mr. Reardon. I would, you know, ask the committee just to maybe pare this down. This is an exhaustive study. Maybe we can get some, you know, a good five bullet points out of it that we can focus on and then decide, all right, can we do this and can the businesses help us? Also, some kind of a welcome sign, you know, maybe at uh, Maple and uh, Saginaw that, hey, you're in Grand Blanc Township. Now, I don't know, maybe there is one there already. Um, but then since that's kind of the entrance to what we're talking about, maybe there's some kind of a, you know, hey, welcome. Well, uh, Mr. Kilmer and I did meet with the, one of the business owners, their property owners that that owns the property on the, uh, I guess it would be the uh, south uh, west corner of Maple and Saginaw, and spoke with him about uh, his intentions, and we plan to follow up with another meeting. But, um, so I think it's going to take some one-on-one -on -one meetings with business owners along here to mm -hmm. figure out and let them know that we're serious about doing something in the area. Mr. Reardon? Yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, we should really consider Mr. Limita's idea, even though we might not realize it under this board, but if we develop uh, like a DDA or a TIP or whatever, it, it might build slowly and maybe the next board or even the board after would be able to utilize mm -hmm. the funds to make significant changes. So, but if we, if we did it now, we would get the process rolling and capture anything that we could, correct? Correct, and it, you know that's one of the things they said. It's it would grow slower, but if if and when the area takes off and begins to make that transition, now you're going to see the taxable value coming as it changes hands, uncaps people come in and revitalize a business. And so you take a two pronged strategy, this being one, and right. the committee as a second. Yeah. And there might be some things that that aren't huge cost to helping might be some things like a welcome sign up there might be beautification efforts uh, we just spent some my wife and I spent some time in Marquette and uh, the, the beautification efforts there are just amazing the, the flowers that are planted along the streets and on the roundabouts are just incredible and uh, you know depending on what the level of interest is with the business owners uh, along this stretch there might be that possibility too of, of doing planting to start with and, and just beautifying the area. So. Another example of that. Yes. Charlevoix, yes. Mm -hmm. they, they definitely put some some real effort into right. beautifying their city. Yep. Okay. Well, unless there's any further comment, we will proceed with uh, having a committee take a look at the study. Yes, Mr. Limita. And before you guys move away from the strategic plan update, I did want to just provide another update to code enforcement. Absolutely. Uh, we met this morning, uh, Attorney Laddie, myself, the planner, uh, code enforcement, um, Amy Wilkinson, and uh, Chief uh, Wiles, and had a further conversation about our code enforcement efforts. I can provide the update that we did make the job offer. It's going through the background process now for the part-time code enforcement official. Uh, would be starting on August 30th or September 1st. The other part-time code enforcement official has a tentative start date of September 27th. So we do have those positions ready to go. Um, but we brought up a lot of uh, good information today about um, some of the pitfalls maybe that we face. Um, and we decided that at your next meeting on September 7th, we're actually going to put it as a agenda item so that we can walk um, the entire board through the process so it's out and we everybody understands 
how the process works currently and what legal environment that we have to operate in while doing this so that I know it's, sometimes it's frustrating if somebody, uh, I read one actually on social media earlier today that somebody had posted, well, I complained about my neighbor, but nothing was ever done. Well, it, 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 it's one of the things about code enforcement. We talked about the 10-day notice period, and then we go there, they ask for more time, we provide more time. Um, by the time you're ticketed, it could take two to three months to go through the court process. So it's, we want to just do that, and I think it would be a good public service as well to have the whole presentation. So um, that would be my proposal for the board is it will just be a brief presentation on code enforcement efforts. We're going to meet before then, and uh, hopefully we can kind of present a better plan for of how code enforcement's moving forward and what we're going to do as part of the overall strategic planning process. Yeah, great. I appreciate that, Mr. Luna. The uh, discussion on social media with regard to code enforcement, uh, I brought up the example of uh, trailers and driveways, and uh, um, I, I received a number of phone calls actually regarding that, and it held true to what I was saying is that uh, by us increasing enforcement, that we are going to actually draw criticism from residents who are opposed to to the enforcement of of, of our ordinances, and so I, I guess there's you know the sign ordinance for example, we we do not allow people to put signs at our exits of our expressways selling bed sheets or work from home or whatever it is. But we also have churches that want to put signs out. We have people that want to put estate sales. We can't regulate based on what the content is. It's like we either allow all these snipe signs or we, we don't allow them at all. And so we've elected to say we're not allowing them at all. Um, but my sign just is going to, you know, everybody has an exception. Um, you know, and the, the idea with the trailer, um, I, I spoke with Jeremy Smith today a little bit about it, what they do in some other communities. Um, but I use my trailer for work, um, or but it's only going to be here for a few days. Uh, there might be some things that we need to tweak, but, um, and I'm sure we're always open to the public making suggestions on how we make that work. Um, I think Davison Township with their trailer program or whatever their ordinance, they allow you to have it there from maybe what, David, May till April to October you can have it. Um, maybe that's something we want to look at. I don't know. But um, it opens up <laughs> a whole bunch of other complaints because all the people that have been keeping trailers out of their neighborhood, now we've given carte blanche between April and October to uh, bring your trailers in, you know. Um, Mr. Laudy? Remember, we at the planning commission level and township board level, we we debated the, the trailer issue, and and this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but half the room was for it and half the room was against it. And yes. Again at the <laughs> commission. So it's a very interesting topic. And, and very right. Interesting Whenever you talk about enforcing ordinances, there there's people on both sides of those ordinances. Um, we have an ordinance with regard to farm animals, right? Ten acres or more. Well, yeah, we do, and, th and that's becoming more and more of an issue. And, and it's interesting because the the chickens, you know, the the smaller livestock kind of comes in and out of fashion, and we and and I think we we're, we're on another wave. And so, people are now um, you're finding them in, in smaller and smaller lots, and, and we're going to have to make a decision about what we want to do with that because obviously some people love them, some people hate them. So um, that'll be something. Unfortunately, you'll have to you'll have to weigh in on. It sounds like a Sounds like a, a, a frivolous topic, but believe me, there are people that are dedicated to it. So you'll be able to explain to us what a city chicken is? <laughs> All varieties of, of uh, chickens we'll cover. So I understand we, we had somebody with some goats, but you know they were they were smaller than some people's dogs. Uh, but well, we do know. have we do, and that's a, and that's a case that's currently pending because our ordinance basically says that you can't have livestock. Unless you have ten acre uh, piece of property, and and then there, so there are exceptions for service animals and things, and, and and you'd be surprised at the at the category of animals that people are are trying to consider service animals, uh, including goats. And I read a case about a, a miniature horse, and mm -hmm. again, folks are creative. Right. So we'll have some interesting uh, discussion as we get into uh, code enforcement. Mr. Fike? I read that social media post that you were referring to, Dennis, and 
you're right, uh, Mr. Laddie. This is a controversial issue, and maybe we should invite the public, if they want to speak out about it, to the next meeting to say. Trailers or the farm animals? Well, mainly the, the trailers. <laughs> um, although, you know, the farm animals is a whole other, uh, I, you know, thought. I know Fenton Township had real issues with this, and it went to court, and it became, got a lot of media publicity. And, you know, I guess my question with that would be, what's the law? I mean, uh, well, with the, with the chickens and, and not, not service animals, <clears throat> the service animals has to do with the Fair Housing Commission, and, and, and so the federal standards are <clears throat> applied to municipalities as well. And, the, and, and the, 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 the rule of thumb is that if you can make a reasonable accommodation for somebody to enjoy their property or, or to uh, rent property, then, then you need to do that. But there, as far as service animals go, the animals have to actually have some specific training or characteristic at that directly benefits whatever condition that the folks have. So it's a case, it's really on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. The issue with the right with, with the chickens is that we have a, a a real amorphous right to farm act in the state of Michigan, and we have these things called generally accepted agricultural management practices. People call them GAMPs, and really it kind of gives uh, carte blanche to the uh, Department of Agriculture to decide what the standards are for livestock. And livestock is any commercial, the keeping of, of commercial animals. And, and you'd be surprised at, at the number of people that sell an egg once a year and, and consider that commercial. Um, but we're not, able to, we're not able to regulate over the top of the Department of Agriculture because theoretically they're the experts and, and we are, um, no. we're, we're sort of jack of all trades, yes. So, Subjects. So, so you, the, the, the problem you have is, is you're always in a battle with, with um, the Department of Agriculture standards or Right to Farm Act standards, and then implementing um, your own regulations. Now, the, the one thing the Department of Ag did is they create, they recognized that they're getting conflicts of, of, of livestock in, in high density residential areas. And so they created um, an option for um, municipalities that takes into account non farm structures and, and how many are in a certain circumference of an area. And then they say to you, if that's your if that if that's your circumstance, municipality, then you're free to regulate these things however you want. You can make you can limit to the numbers. You can put them in certain locations. You can you can't actually overrule the Department of Ag when it comes to a high to, to um, high density residential. Um, so that so that's an option for us. Um, we did it in. Well, we, we actually did sort of a comprehensive one in Davison that's, that's got mixed reviews, as, as you would expect. And, and so we could present an option to you to consider um, if, if you feel that it's becoming more and more of a problem. And I, I, right now, we have, I think, three chicken cases pending in district court and a goat case. Um, so we'll, uh, I'll kind of give you an update on, on what those are and what your options are. And, and um, it comes around enough so that we probably should should give some thought to what we want to do in the long term. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we have run into issues. I mean, it isn't just, uh, and I'm sure that's why we're in court. I mean, these, these chickens create a nuisance for the people that live around them in some of these situations. It isn't just a matter of picking on somebody because they have a couple of chickens. Uh, right, David? I mean, yeah, the, yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Um, again, it, it's just divisive. You either... You're either okay with it or you got a big problem with it. It's very interesting. I mean, we've had situations where the smell and the the uh, manure or what have you from the chickens was uh, untenable to the, the residents living around them. We did. We had a, we had a case in, in the north uh, west portion of the township in an R4 district where a lady had, it wasn't so much chickens, it was rabbits. She had a lot of rabbits on a really small lot, and, and it was... It really affected the neighbors mm -hmm. substantially, right? And um, yeah, so it can be an issue. The other issue is that, uh, just for the board's information, that uh, something that's kind of going on, and uh, I, I'm new to knowing about this, so maybe you are too. But um, kind of, you know, we're in the age of Uber and Lyft, where people use their own vehicles transport people we have people also doing that with their RVs renting them out to people well now comes a service for pet watching that if you want to become a, a person that watches people's pets 
you list yourself on this website that now you can for whatever your fee is you can start watching pets and become almost like your own kennel and so we have one resident uh, that I'm aware of that had 15 animals that they were watching at $25 a day and they were listed on this on this website and advertising on social media and so it becomes a business pretty much out of their home but I mean when you get 15 dogs and paying $25 per day at making some pretty good money but it also is creating quite a nuisance for the neighbors mm -hmm. right so I'm not sure you know there's I, I know municipalities are creating laws for um, ordinances regarding vacation home rentals I don't know if there's ordinances that could be put in place for people you know I know we have a limit of like five dogs I think yeah I mean they uh, may be less than that um, I thought it was three I think it's three. three. Okay. In, in right. We can regulate domestic animals, so we we have the ability to do that, and um, and so that that scenario, that hypothetical that you just described, that would be contrary to our ordinance and, and easier to enforce than some of the other okay. um, agricultural sure. ordinances. So. so it's everything's constantly changing, and we have to evolve with it, right? <laughs> so. Okay, anything else on our strategic plan? Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to new business. Uh, item 7A, the board will consider a motion to approve a contract with Water Management Specialist, Inc., to perform restoration work on the multipurpose field at Creasy Bicentennial Park in the amount of $28,408 and for the township superintendent to sign all related contracts and documents. So moved. What's that? I so moved. Okay. Motion by uh, Treasurer Kilmer. Oh, can we have some discussion? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, or by we need support by Raritan. Okay. Okay. In discussion, um, I'm sure we'll have presentation here. If you want to hear from our parks director? Yes, we do. Like, what is this? Linehan. <laughs> okay. So uh, a couple years ago, um, the old parks commission. Uh, started to install a multi-purpose field on the north end of the park um when you say the old commission that was a commission run by the city the schools and the township correct just so the board's familiar with so in the past year and a half we took over our park in the running of it correct um since the uh, inception of the project there's uh, been um some issues uh with uh the irrigation quality uh, of the grass, the ground, all of that. Um, so the past contractor brought in this company, Water Management Services, who is also the one that has done uh, our infields and who will be doing the water line restoration. Um, so they came in, they redid the, um, uh, the irrigation and that, and you know, we, We've been having trouble with the grass growing and we finally identified that there was actually a uh, high salt content uh, in the ground so uh, we've been flushing that out and um, this is their recommended plan on uh, how to establish uh, the grass mr white this is the soccer fields uh the the multi-purpose field that is right next to is across from the soccer fields right next to the north pavilion so there, there's the playground right there, and then there's that, that large field in between. That's what we're talking about. We haven't been able to use it for anything because we've been trying to get grass to grow there, and it just Correct. wouldn't grow. Yep. Okay. Is it possible to flush that out? I mean, is this something They've, feasible? Yeah, so um, we've, we've been doing uh, ground uh, corings of it, and then we've just been putting uh, massive amounts of, uh, of fresh water on it to uh to drive the salt uh down and out so where where does the salt come was the salt just if we're if we're washing it out how do we know it won't come back um so we're changing our water source um uh the the, the salt content was um a direct result of our of our water source Anything, Mr. Lehman, on subject? Uh, 
Dennis from Water Management Specialists. Um, we first hired him uh, a year and a half ago, or whatever it was, when we first did the ball field, uh, the very first quad that we redid um, on a competitive bid. He came in uh, lower than everyone else who bid on it. He's done extensive work, including like for Central Michigan University. He's really focused on a lot of athletic fields. Not only did he come in considerably lower than the others, but he also uh, came in and said, um, hey, you've got some requirements in here that you don't need, and I'm going to show you why you don't need it. And he saved us an additional $40,000 on, uh, it took something out of the bid just to show us that, in his professional opinion, it would have been uh, overkill for what we're trying to accomplish, and it came out. So we, the guy has the most integrity. We, we really appreciated working with him. He did the other quad of uh, softball fields this year and uh, he's the one who helped us with this uncover what the issue was w with this in fact he was able to show us that the original uh, contractor had put in not up to bid specifications on the um, water uh, line through that multi-purpose field and uh, we were able to have the original contractor fix all of that system at no cost to us. This guy's been nothing but a you know, great professional consultant for us out at Parks and Recreation. And I think Patrick's recommendation to use him uh, to really get this project turned around is is a um, good recommendation. Patrick, what, uh, or Mr. Linhan, when's the projected timeline for being able to use that field with using these guys? Um, at this point, uh, we'll probably be looking at uh, spring for use. Okay. Um, you know, we're we're not going to be extremely aggressive because um, as far as growing grass and that sort of thing, you know, we want to make sure, you know, that we uh, take the time, um, you know, to let everything grow in uh, and that uh, you'll see in the packet that he is calling, um, you know, he'll, he'll maintain a fertilized program and that for a year. Um, you know, after after we start the project, so you know he's in it for the long run uh, on this to to make sure that it grows. So. What is the plan for the all-purpose field? Is it lacrosse or? Well, it's a multi-purpose field, so. Um, types of thing. I mean. Yep. So lacrosse. so lacrosse, soccer, and uh, football. Okay. So very good. Well, it seems to be a worthwhile expenditure to me. Yeah, uh, so. be able to use it. Yep. Okay, any other have a, discussion? We, There's a motion to support. A motion to support. Yep. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Linehan. Item 7B, the board will consider a motion to approve the purchase of 10 patrol rifles and accessories in the amount of $14,100 and for the township superintendent to execute all related contracts and documents. Uh, the information was in your packet regarding this. Uh, we have Chief Ron Wiles here. Anybody has any questions? Yeah, just one. Yeah. Uh, Please, Chief. Hey, Chief. What do we do with the ones we're replacing? The That's an excellent question. So it's a long story. Let me try to give the short version. Okay. okay. Once we, we, are, digest, okay. We, we have a multi-year plan in place to replace aging patrol rifles that literally were manufactured in the 70s. We got those as part of a uh, military program back in the day called the 1122 program, um, where municipalities bought rifles from the government to use during their patrol operations. Um, we are stuck with those rifles. We can't sell them. Um, we can't trade them. We are stuck with them. Um, so we are holding on to them. Um, and it has been a, I can't tell you all the steps we've gone through to try to find a re resolution to that so we don't have these things. Um, we've talked to the ATF, we've talked to other branches of the federal government, um, and everyone tells us the same answer, there's nothing you can do with them. You have to keep them. But they're very, they're highly collectible, they're right? Highly collectible. However, we cannot uh, sell them or part with them. Yeah, at one point, um, previous to this plan in place, we had a deal worked out with a person that had a federal firearms license where we were going to trade these rifles for um, handguns and rifles. Um, and we could not do that because we can't get rid of them. Um, I'm learning new things all the time. Uh, what, uh, as, as weapons get older, do they become less difficult to, or are they more difficult to maintain? Do they become a, a hazard or a liability to officers in the field? What's, 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 uh, what say you? 
Yeah, so, so like anything, you, um, I should say like any piece of equipment we have, it is well maintained. We've done everything we can to maintain these, make sure they're operational. Currently they are operational. But over the years, especially from the 70s, technology changes a little bit. Um, everything, including weapons, become more reliable, easier to use, um, easier to service, easier to maintain, and um, easier to add other accessories to, whether that is a, um, a sling, a light, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's where we are now. These, these older weapons, um, while they are functional, operational, um, they're to the point where um, in today's environment, in the law enforcement world, they're not ideal. And that's why we started this plan several years ago to start replacing these. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Appreciate it. So Any other questions? You're going to replace them, but, but you're not going to get rid of them. Correct. They'll remain locked up. Just going to get more. Yep. And should that change in the future, some change of the rule at the federal level, we will certainly um, come back to the board and, and see if we can uh, get rid of them. So whether or not we buy these other 10 rifles here really has nothing to do with we we can't we can't sell the, the right. right okay okay so, yes okay there's a motion supported um and who is that motion by again? motion by dr raritan raritan motion by raritan supported, supported by, by trustee fike fike okay all those in favor say aye aye any opposed Okay, thank you. Right there, I am. <laughs> Maybe we can put like a display case for the old rifles or something. Here. Good. <laughs> okay, item C, uh, the board will consider a motion to approve the requested pay scale for part-time radio operator slash clerk wages. Chief? Yeah, so as you know, we run a um, dispatch records area 24-7. Um, and, and the people that staff that currently are five full-time employees that uh, their wages are governed by a collective bargaining agreement. Then we have a part-time contingent that covers um, shifts where they are off, whether it's sickness, time off, whatever the case may be. Currently, we have three part-time um, contingent radio operators, clerks. We are doing backgrounds on four, so that'll take that number to seven to uh, fill in those gaps. Um, they are not covered by, their wages are not covered by a collective bargaining agreement. Um, their, their wages are set by the board. Um, their wages have not changed since 2014. So respectfully, I come today to ask for an increase in their, their wages um, to a more um, current updated rate um, that would put them in line with uh, where they should be. Okay. Is that right? Okay. Currently, their rate for a starting wage is $13.50. I'd like to raise that to $15. Their first year, one year wage is $14.25. I'd like to raise that to $16. Their two year wage is $16. I'd like to raise that to $18. And their three year wage is $18. I'd like to raise that to $20. And again, that was last time it was updated was 2014. You know, given the current environment, I think that's appropriate. So I'd move, I'd make the motion. Okay. It's your support by Ms. Hugo. I got a question. Sure. Musical. Mr. Fike? For the chief, are these raises, uh, you know, comparable to other townships and cities uh, around? Well, in Genesee County, there's not a whole lot of other departments that do what we do when it comes to, we have our 24 seven, we staff that area where they um, take calls from residents, where they can dispatch cars if need be, um, do um, lean work for, for officers in the field. I don't know of another agency that has that capability in Genesee County. Flint Township does, but they don't do the same things. City of Fenton, they have their own PSAP down there, so they're, a little, they're even different than us. Um, Genesee County Sheriff's Office, they have people there that do similar things, but we're just on a different scale than, than what we do here. Um, so there's really no comparable here in Genesee County. And to Dennis, is, have you figured out if we do this, how much you know, this is gonna cost us, say in a year? Yeah, and Ron and I discussed that before he made the presentation. We walked through it. I don't have the in front of me, um, Mr. Fike, unfortunately, Sorry. but uh, there is enough money in contingent wages in the 2021 budget um, currently to cover anything through here, and we've already uh, put it into, built it into the 2022 budget in anticipation of the board's approval. We can afford it. 
can afford. I think after, if you look at, you know, after seven years of not making any adjustment on this, and if you just, or if you drive past McDonald's right now, I think they're advertising 1350. There's a lot of competition out there. We found this when we were filling parks and recreation jobs earlier this year. Uh, used to be everybody loved to go outside for parks and recreation, work for the summer um, at $10.22 an hour. I think we were at, we couldn't get uh, a applicant. At, it's just the wage inflation has gone up, and especially with here, we're looking for some qualified people who can still remain calm under pressure. It is a, you know, you think it's just a, you know, more of a dispatch. It's not a, it, it's a still a skill set that not everybody can accomplish. Mm -hmm. okay. I can tell you this, I, I, one of the officers with 911 consortium here in Genesis County, and uh, they have a tough time finding people to, to work as uh, 911 operators um, the burnout rates pretty quick and the wages are substantially higher so you know we're competing probably for the same type of person or same person you know same people so mm -hmm. um, I commend your recruitment efforts that we have you know we've been successful but I can see us getting to a point where we won't be able to find people if we don't adjust our wages so you know I, I'd like to add I I worked as a corrections officer, I worked as a radio operator, police officer, and the radio operator's job is significant. It's, there's so much stress there that people don't realize because they're trying to handle people on the phone, communicate to the officer. If they give the wrong information to the officer, things can drastically change. So this seems really reasonable. You know, and, and, and these people at our department, they, they are the voice of Grambling Township. When you call for help, right. whatever that is, that who, that's who answers the phone. That's the first yeah. voice you hear. That's the first impression you have of Grambling oh. Township or Grambling Township Police Department. If I'm having an emergency in my home, I want to make sure the person that's answering the phone at Grambling Township, you know, emergency services is uh, somebody who's on the ball. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kilmer? I'd like to say that, that recently I had occasion to use that service. No, and they did an excellent job. Thank God they were there. Right. Okay, so it sounds like... Uh, well, I'll make the motion to uh, uh, approve if, if that's in order, Mr. Supervisor. Okay. Sure. That okay. Was, and I couldn't remember if we already had a motion. Uh, I don't know that we did. Okay. Supported by uh, Raritan. Raritan, very good. Uh, All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Next is our uh, future agenda items. Uh, Mr. Lehman, any thoughts on what we want to cover with our strategic plan at our next meeting? So we can go wherever, uh, you know, we can do another broad overview or we can do a dive into any one of the other ones that we haven't done yet. If I um, made the suggestion, it would be about the branding. Um, one of your community connectiveness and identity goals uh, was branding for Grand Blanc Township and it's it's making Grand Blanc Township visibly distinguished from other municipalities. Your committee has met, you've chosen a logo, you've done a lot of the things. I think it would be a good time to uh, maybe get a little bit of an update on that and then dive into that a little bit deeper. And then of course you'll also be having the presentation on code enforcement. That may lead to additional discussion. I think that would be good. I think, you know, one of the things with signage too is uh, with that logo, we've got, uh, I forget how many signs around the township uh, leading into the, the township that say, you know, they're just the small metal ones, but uh, we know where all of those are and we've got photos, every one of them. And uh, after we're, we go through the branding with our board, maybe we can uh, take on that project to replace those as well. So, okay, very good. Next on the agenda are board reports. And uh, anything, Ms. Hugo, with regard to planning? I don't have anything to report other than our next meeting is September 2nd. Okay. I had a few individuals ask me if we were going to be talking about the McCandless Road uh, project uh, at this meeting, um, including some news media. I told them no, that really uh, I don't believe we received any application at this point other than for the rezoning request. Is that 
correct that you know of, Mr. Lehman? Uh, they had asked to be on the planning commission um, for the September 2nd meeting with a straight up rezoning request. We've been doing our due diligence like we always do with any, uh, especially a major development, uh, to make sure that we can unequivocally either say yes or no, that everything seems to be falling into place. We've uncovered a couple of issues uh, with that proposal on McCandlish Road. Number one that we think needs to be addressed is the stormwater runoff. It has to be contained on your property, and I think it's important that they provide us that information before we move it forward. The other thing is about three years ago, um, the actual uh, sanitary sewer pump station on McCandlish by McCandlish and Saginaw, we don't own that property and we worked with the property owner to try to secure a permanent easement and to purchase it and um, they turned us down. Uh, so we uh, did a, a estimate or had an engineer's estimate put together for what it would be if we abandoned that pump station and went to a gravity feed. Um, but it came in at about $2.4 million back then, and it was at least three years ago. Uh, one of the reasons being is when they built up that intersection, so we'd have to bring it down 50 foot deep. Not only do, would we have to do that, but then the road commission's requiring that we repave the entire road because where it is is right below the road surface on the west side of Saginaw McCandless intersection. Uh, $2.4 million uh, today, I'm sure, is going to be a lot closer to $3 million. We need to abandon that pump station. So I think in the interest of, of full disclosure, we've asked these guys, we've, we're putting the uh, engineers back next week, pulling them in for a meeting to discuss what that looks like in today's dollars on that uh, gravity feed, as well as you know abandoning the, the current pump station. And we think... Uh, we'll have the meeting with the engineers, and then we've requested that the proposed developers come in for a meeting the week after that so that we can show them all the things that, you know, would be required for us to do that project. Uh, I think that, that both of those are significant issues and hurdles that I think I would much rather they were aware of those and had a plan to address it before we go through a rezoning and they start site plan review and then they get hit with these things. Um, it's just not a good way to do business. I'd rather manage those expectations up front. And Planner Smith and I have been working on it, uh, along with uh, DPS Director Sears and uh, Scott Haymeyer and Jack Wheatley from Row Engineering. So it's probably going to delay it till October at least. Um, maybe they can address these things right now. We couldn't make the recommendation to move forward with that abandonment of the pump station because we've the board has approved the KCI project moving forward. If we're gonna do the gravity feed, that's probably a 2025 project would, would get fit into our capital projects plan or somewhere around 2025. So um, that's kind of where we're at, some new information, they've been provided that. Uh, so uh, it's kind of, you know, how we move forward from there mm -hmm. we'll be in October, um, I, I just can't say at this time. And that's nothing to say there, there's other things that might be required too. I, I can imagine with uh, McCandless Road being one lane each way, uh, I have to believe that a third lane uh, might be required right there if you're having that number of, uh, you know, condos or apartments built. Yeah, they'll have to conduct a complete traffic study uh, for as part of the site plan review process. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some concerns there. Uh, because of the, there's a significant impact. There's a hill right there. And as you know, my house is the one that's right on top of that hill there. So I, I understand the sight line, the visibility issue um, that exists right there. And I, they're going to be required to address uh, uh, that issue as well. Um, we tried to, rather than wait and let somebody expend a lot of money on architects and engineers and then get to the point where they get the rug pulled out from under their feet, our goal is always to manage expectations by providing any significant, uh, you know, things that we see in advance so that they can make informed decisions um, before they're, they've uh, expended a lot of money. Not saying that this stops the project, but uh, it, it, they're going to need to address those issues to move forward. I think it's good that our, our township uh, take that kind of view. It you know, before somebody does expend a lot of money and effort, and then they find out that it's not feasible. So, Dennis, could they use the old pump station or no? The, 
the problem with using the old pump station is we were going to replace it three years ago, and that's why we did the engineering study. Um, because of that, we weren't able to make a deal with the property owner. We do need to abandon it. It needs to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, if we use a pump station, it has to be sized accordingly. We've got plenty of capacity downstream. What we don't have is capacity at the pump station. And whenever we can abandon a pump station, we do so. A rebuild To rebuild a pump station is over a million dollars. Um, gets you good for about 20 years, but anytime we can abandon it, abandon one and go to gravity feed, it's obviously better because we, we lose one big maintenance item. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we have to find property to put it on. I mean, I, there's, it's a significant challenge at this point. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lehman. Uh, Mr. White, anything with Zoning Board of Appeals? Okay. Mr. Fike, any Metro Alliance? Mr. Reard, anything with police other than what we heard this evening? Uh, Mr. Treasurer Kilmer, I'm good. Okay. Uh, Clerk Robertson? Nothing. Okay. A um, couple of things uh, with regard to uh, activities. The DDA uh, is uh, moving forward with uh, creating a video, a uh, professional video, um, to help us market the Grand Blanc Township, specifically the DDA area. But mm -hmm. I think overall it will help uh, with the, uh, the township. It's going to feature uh, some of the reasons why businesses would want to uh, consider Grand Blanc Township since we're globally positioned for success, GPS. So, um, so that's exciting. Our website uh, design, I know uh, Ms. Roberts is working diligently on, on that, and the DDA has uh, also uh, is moving forward with being part of that website as well. Uh, we have the Ally Challenge coming up uh, this weekend, which I'm sure everybody here is aware of, and we ask the public to uh, support as well. Um, complete with a concert on Saturday evening. Um, I'm not real familiar with the group, but I'm sure many of you are. Uh, what's the name of I'll be there. Little Big Little Town? Big town. Little yeah. Big Town, okay. Won a lot of awards. Okay, well, um, I'm more of a classic rock but uh, I'm, I'll be there but uh, there'll be fireworks at the end of the evening mm -hmm. um, so that'll be fun um, an issue that uh, continues to uh, be going brewing is uh, an EMT emergency medical technician uh, issue that's going on with uh, a couple of municipalities in, in the county that want to uh, change how we currently handle uh, those services uh, I'm not uh, in favor of, of making a change, but um, I'm just one voice, so I know that uh, we'll be meeting on that issue very soon. So uh, with that, uh, the Dort Highway extension continues. I haven't seen any work uh, continuing on that right now, but uh, the engineering, as we mentioned at the last meeting, is still being worked out, and uh, hopefully we'll see that uh, get back underway. I, I believe they opened the uh, portion between Pollock Road and... Uh, and Baldwin Road, at least when I drove by there, it appeared that it was open. So with that, uh, Mr. Laddie, I know we're going to go into executive session, but before we do that, anything to report on? The no, sir. Okay. Mr. No. Limita, anything to report on before? It's the uh, budget process for fiscal year 2022. Uh, by law, the board has to receive the general fund and special revenue fund budgets uh, by September 1st every year, and we do that electronically. We've been meeting nonstop over the last few weeks trying to put uh, wrap that up. We finished our departmental review this afternoon. Uh, Finance Director uh, Kathy Sostak will be working on putting the uh, initial draft together. Then we'll go through on Thursday, and I'll make my recommendations for where I think uh, the changes to the department requested budgets uh, to see where we're at, and then uh, we'll finalize that document. You'll have it uh, sometime on or before September 1st in an electronic format. It will be sent to you electronically. Then we compile a hard copy for each board member. So on the meeting of September 7th, you'll have the actual hard copy document that will include all of the department heads narrative, my narrative on the overall budget process. It'll include 
uh, the capital improvement plan. It'll include the fee schedule for your review to help support what the fiscal year 2022 budget is requesting from all the departments. Um, and that's basically the process. We will plan to have the departmental overview to the board whenever the board is ready for it. Um, typically, it would be that first meeting in October. It gives you guys 30 days to review uh, the budget and get questions answered or get comfortable. And then we would put on the presentation. Every department head would be here. They'll walk you through uh, why their budget request is what it was. Um, we can discuss the differences if I didn't make my recommendation the same as theirs, which often happens. Um, but it's with an eye towards, not that I don't trust my department heads to request the appropriate amount, but it's so that we can fund everything. And especially now with the strategic plan adopted, we wanna make sure we're doing that appropriately. Uh, and that we still have our major focus is on unfunded liabilities. We have to be able to make sure we're funding that appropriately as well. That's kind of the process. I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have throughout this as we go through it. But um, once we walk you through it the first year, I think uh, you'll understand the process and a lot of it is legally prescribed on how we go about it. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to um, ask for, we're going to go into a closed session. I first want to just uh, pass on our Board's condolences to uh, the Raritan family, to Jude uh, Thank you. and your family for um, the passing of your mother this past week. So um, our thoughts are with you, and we appreciate you being here with us tonight. Um, with that, uh, Mr. Laddie, I believe, or Mr. Lumina. Motion to... for uh, closed session to discuss uh, an employment contract negotiation. Okay. okay. Uh, this roll call? Uh, well, we need a motion by Ms. Hugo. We'll motion make that motion. Hugo. Supported by uh, Mr. White, okay. Trustee White. Closed session. Uh, roll call vote, so go ahead, Mr. Lane. Okay. Uh, yes. Mr. Roberts. Uh, Trustee Fike. Yes. Trustee White. Yes. Trustee Hugo. Yes. Trustee Raritan. Yes. Treasurer Kilmer. Yes. Uh, myself, yes. Supervisor Bennett. Yes. Okay, we go into closed session at 8.14 p.m. Okay. We'll meet uh, right in the conference room right here to the right. <clears throat> okay, so uh, motion to uh, resume uh, regular session. Session at 8.40, 8.43 p.m. Supported by Clerk Robertson. Mm -hmm. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? With that, um, I would like to make a motion to um, ask that we move forward with um, an employment agreement for a deputy fire chief and uh, authorize the supervisor and the clerk to um, execute the agreement. I'll support that. Okay, supported by Motion Raritan. By Bennett, supported by Raritan. Probably need a roll call vote. Yes, if we could. Trustee White. Yes. Trustee Raritan. Yes. Trustee Fike? Yes. Trustee Hugo? Yes. Myself? Yes. Treasurer Kilmer? Yes. Supervisor Bennett? Yes. Seven nothing, motion passes. I would like to also make a motion that uh, we move forward with uh, the employment agreement for our Director of Information uh, Systems, that we authorize the supervisor and the clerk to uh, execute the agreement Move forward with the hiring. And I'll support that. Okay. Motion by Bennett, supported by Raritan. Record roll call. Trustee Hugo? Yes. Trustee Fike? Yes. Trustee Raritan? Yes. Trustee White? Yes. Treasurer Kilmer? Yes. Myself, yes. Supervisor Bennett? Yes. Seven nothing, motion passes. Uh, Mr. Limita, uh, uh, is it okay if we mention the names of the individuals? Or So we'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Kent Miracle for uh, the position of uh, Deputy Fire Chief, and that'll be announced, I'm sure, shortly. And our Director of Information Services, uh, Nathan Lucevelt. So both uh, very qualified candidates, and we're looking forward to having them mm -hmm. um, on a more permanent basis. So congratulations to both of them. Mm -hmm. That I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Support. 
Okay. Non-debatable. We All are. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned at 8:45 p.m. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>